Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Uh, you know, I've never, I've, I've never preached that I'm going to preach today. Yeah, woo! I'm glad one person's excited. I normally have like four verses and a few points, but today I'm going to read a whole context of a story. And so I know that uh, for some of you, I, I have ADD, so it's hard for me to stay focused a lot. That's why I'm blessed to do many things. Um, it just people are like, how do you do that? It's the way God created me. So, you know, it's just the way it is. So I know that for some of you, it may be difficult to stay focused, but come on, check in, okay? The water's good. You're going to love it. So make sure that you stay focused. You read line by line because I promise you, many of you have read this, this context of a story, and many of you already will already probably think, oh, I know where he's going. No, you don't. I'm going to throw a whole other angle on you. I'm going to bring a whole other revelation to you. I'm going to bring you a whole other understanding. And I want you to under, understand today that God wants to speak to every single. This message is for every single one of us, including moi. It's for everybody. And so are you ready for this? Awesome. How many believe, first of all, before I get started, how many believe that the local church was God's plan to breathe life into this world? How many honestly believe that? Lift your hand if you believe that. Look around you. Don't put your hand down. Look around you. How many believe that? Say it with me. The local church, the local church. is God's plan God. to breathe life. God. All right. Do you believe that? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. All right. We'll see. We'll see. How many believe that? Just one more. I want to double check because some of you aren't convinced anymore. You're like, oh, man, maybe, maybe I don't believe that. Look at your neighbor and be like, do you, be, do you honestly believe that? Just uh, ask him for a minute. Okay, let's get in. There's three types of people in every single church in America today. Three types. The first person is, is the person who believes in breathing life, believes in the, the power of the local church and has done everything they possibly can to bring life to their family members, their friends, their co-workers, maybe a son, a daughter, maybe a mother, a father, and you've done everything you possibly could to bring them the life of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to save them, to help them, to, to believe in them. Listen, I know it's easier to dig dirt out of people, but... I'll tell you, it's harder to dig for gold. And you need to see the gold in people in order for you to ever want to see the best in them. And so there's that person that's done everything and you've grown weary. You've, maybe you've grown tired and, or maybe you've lost hope. And you kind of feel like they're never going to come to God, honestly. They're just not going to. I've tried everything. I've, 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 you know, thrown oil all over their pillow. I've, I've, uh, I've slept in their bed and believing that as they lay there that the power of God's going to hit them because I went and laid in their bed too as well. And so when they lay there, it's like my spirit there. I mean, you've done possibly everything. You've encouraged them. You've sent them scriptures. You, and, and you just got tired and you just kind of feel like, I don't think they're ever going to come. That's the first person. The second person is the person that, um, that is basically just gasping for air. That's the person that, you know what, maybe knows God or doesn't know God. Do you know, do you know that you can be so close to God and yet be so absent from his presence? I'm not saying him. God's never absent. But you can be absent. I can be absent. And, um, and so there's people that, that may be here today that you're just gasping for air. You're just trying to take the next breath. And it's been so difficult for you. I mean, if you think about it, the brain needs oxygen. If oxygen doesn't get to the brain, what happens to you and I? We pass out. We die eventually. And so God is trying to breathe life back into us today. So that's the second person. The third person is the person that's consumed with themselves. They're distracted with or with their comforts, their success, their relationships, their homes, their cars, their stuff. Nothing wrong with stuff. But when you're consumed with your stuff and it preoccupies you with your own personal life, not realizing that God has called you to be the breath of life for others, or you're distracted with with ideas and, and, and you're, cons you're consuming 
lies or doubts or fears. And, and so that's the other type of person that, that without even knowing, they can be sitting and just enjoying messages and, and worship and giving God a praise. But then they walk out and, and nothing's changed. And if you look at the stories, every time that Jesus spoke to his disciples, he was always continually bringing to their ears the fact that we not only need to be compassionate people for faraway people from God, but we are, we are to be active people. Jesus told different stories in this parables. He said he left, you remember the story about leaving the 99 for the one? That was one story he talked about. Basically, he said, okay, I'll leave the 99 sheep here because one straight away and that one matters. Let me go get that one person. So how many know that it doesn't matter where you're at in life. You may think God doesn't care about me. Well, guess what? If Jesus leaves the 99 for the one, trust me, he can handle you. And then he, and then he told the story about the missing coin. Remember the lost coin? That's another story he talked about. I'm not going to get into those verses. And uh, talked about the woman that was in there sweeping and checking and moving and, uh, and all for one lost coin. Well, guess what? Maybe you're sitting here today and you feel lost. Jesus cares about you as well. But let's get to the story of what we're going to talk about today. And that's the prodigal son. I want you to listen because we're going to read all the verses of that. And I want you to ask God right now, just close your eyes for a second and say, Lord, give me new lenses. And a spiritual understanding to see what you need to show me. Say, I'm ready. I'm your student. I'm a learner of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Let's read this together. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 15. And then we may pause and just talk about a few things here. I want you to stay in tune, okay, because God's going to speak to you um, in several ways. I believe that, that God's going to maybe give someone an answer. God's going to maybe give someone some insight, some wisdom, maybe even a strategy. I don't know, but, but just pay attention today because I believe beyond the message that, that, that we have for you, I believe God's going to speak to you. All right, ready? Luke 15, verse 11, and we're going to read all the way to 32, but don't, don't get ahead of me. Stay with me. Stay in step because the steps of a righteous man and woman are ordered by Pastor Mauricio today. <laughs> Jesus continued. Jesus what? Continued. That means that he continued to have the same conversation with his disciples. The same topic kept coming up. So Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. Today I want to talk about the tale of two sons. It's the tale of two sons and a father. And I know that many times we focus solely on the prodigal. But there's, this is a story of two people and a dad. Verse 12. And the younger son spoke to his father and he said, give me my share of the family property. So the father divided his property between his two sons. Not long after that younger son packed up all he had. Then he left for a country far away. There he wasted. Everybody say wasted. That, that name prodigal means waster. He wasted his money on wild living. He spent everything he had. Then the whole country ran low on food, so the son didn't have what he needed. And he went to work for someone who lived in that country. And that person sent the son to the fields to feed the pigs. And the son wanted to fill his stomach with the food the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. You know, you can be at a place in life where you feel like, man, I'm in the pigsty. You can feel like, man, I feel like I'm so low right now. I feel like dirt. I mean, this guy came to the end of himself. He wasted everything to the point that not even pigs would share a meal with him. And the son wanted to fill his stomach with the food and the pigs wouldn't give him anything. And then, verse 17, then he began to think clearly again. Then he began to think clearly again. I'm praying that we would have a spirit of thinking clearly again. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough food? But here I am dying from hunger. Come on, he wouldn't even dying from his sin. He was dying from his physical needs. I will get up and go back to my father 
And I will say to him, this is where he bring, brings out his little notepad and pen, and he starts writing almost like a letter, just rehearsing what he wants to tell his father. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven. So he wants to tell dad right away, Father, I messed up. And I have sinned against you. Not only did I sin against heaven and God the Father, but Father, I sinned against you. I have, I have put our family in some very bad situations. I have put, I have placed our family in, in a not so good place. And I'm no longer, look at this, and I'm no longer fit to be called your son. And maybe you feel that you're not fit to be called a daughter. Maybe you're here today and you don't feel like you're fit to be called a son. Maybe because right now you've experiencing some things like the prodigal son. Maybe there's been some rebellion in you. Maybe there's been some, some, some issues in your heart that you haven't addressed like forgiving and, and, and releasing. And you're just walking around in bitterness. And you just feel like, how can God even accept me if I can't even accept others? And so this guy's like, man, I'm not even fit to even be called your son anymore. I'm not fit to be called your daughter. Make me at least like one of your hired servants, verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father. And while, listen to this, and while the son was still a long, everybody say long way off. Because you're going to get this story right now. So just picture it. I want you to just picture, uh, picture these times. Think fields and, and hills and, and grass and, and, and dirt. And so the father sees his son a long way out. You know what that tells me? That you can't be so far away that the father can't see you. He was filled with tender love for his son. He ran to him. He did what? And he threw his arms what? And he what? Everybody go like this. Thank you. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father. Come on, look at that. He immediately comes. He starts. He, he already memorized his script. Father, I have sinned, look at this, against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer fit to be called your son. But the father said, I'm, I'm sure he, he just cut him off, like, okay, put, I know you wrote this down, put that away. And he says, look, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattest calf. Notice it didn't say the smallest calf. This is the fattest calf. And kill it. Let's have a feast. And what? This son of mine was dead. And now he's alive again. And he was lost. And now he is. So they began to. And the older son was in the field. And when he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants. He asked to him, hey, man, what's going on? And he said, verse 27, your brother's, ha your brother's come home. And the servant replied, your father has killed the fattest calf. And he has done this because your brother is back safe and sound. And the older brother became. And he refused to go in. See. You may not be the prodigal son or daughter, but this is the tale of two sons. But you may be the slave in the house, the slave to anger, the slave to bitterness, the slave to unforgiveness, the slave. And he says, he refused to go in. So his father went out and he baked him. This is the brother, guys. This is... This is, this is like me. And I remember my brother was an atheist as well as I was. Me not caring about my brother who was lost, sick, bound, broken. Just the worst of the worst. And now he's home and I'm ticked. How dare. And, and I look at my dad like, man, are you kidding me? You're throwing him a party after he just wasted all your money? Isn't that how we think as humans? 
Like, they don't deserve it. They don't deserve forgiveness. So his father went out and he bathed him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've worked like a what? It's like many of us here. All these years I have been walking in the steps that you ordered and I've been good. And why is it that the heathen at work always gets the promotion? They don't even go to church. I go to church. They don't even pray. I pray. I serve you in the house. How is it that they can own a house and I can't have a house? Slave. Slave. You can be so close to the Father and yet so absent from love. Where did I do my iPad? Thank you. It happens to me a lot. Don't, don't freak out. But this son of yours, he wasted your money with some prostitutes. Look, he starts bringing up his dirt. He was with some prostitutes. He was drinking, smoking, drugging it up, parting it up. And you have the audacity to celebrate him. And you give him a ring and a robe. And you killed my fat calf that was for my sweet 16. (laughs) These were kids. My son, my daughter, the father said, you are always with me. In other words, I got you. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. This brother of yours was dead. And now he's alive again. And he was lost. And now he is found. As I started reading this and and looking a little bit more deeper into it, you could only think, why was it that the brother wasn't out looking for his brother? His brother, of course, made his own choice. He made his own decision to do what he wanted to do. I get that. We all have a choice. We choose to sin. We choose to do what we want. And then we're going to do what we're going to want to do. But how is it that this brother had no compassion, had no no concern Uh, I mean obviously there must have already been some heart issues with him Uh, I'm sure he was probably happy when he left and here you have the son who's he's bitter he's angry he's he's upset and and he's upset because you know he wanted a party but let's recap a little bit here. Let's start with the, the prodigal son. What does he do? He, he basically is saying this to his dad when he says this. He says, I want to spend my money now. In other words, I'm going to do what I'm going to do now. Get out of my way. Number two, he also said, I want to pretend also that you have already died so I can have my share of my wealth. In other words, here's the deal. In the custom of Jewish custom in, 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 in the first century, there was a custom where, where when, when the father passed, the sons would divide all of the... Now, mind you, this is custom. And, and not everybody today has, free, uh, has wills and all that stuff. But we're talking about custom. The custom was that the father would, would raise up enough money to provide for his sons so that his sons can then continue the legacy of his father. So think, the legacy of his father, the father's not even dead, and the son's already cursing the father's legacy. And he says, let's just pretend I won't say nothing if you won't say nothing. Just give me what belongs to me. Give me your wealth, and we're good. We'll just pretend. Let's break the custom right now and just pretend you're dead, pretty much. And so we know that the father then gives him what he, what he asked for. How many know that God is never going to force himself on you? He's going to let you choose what you want. But how many know there's consequences with those choices? But how many know that there's hope again? For all of us. And so this son is basically telling his dad, you don't exist anymore to me. That's painful as a mother, as a father. If you're a mom or dad in here right now and you have kids that are off and, and just 
lost, don't lose hope. Jesus put these words in the Bible for a good reason. Because he, would, he, knew that, he knew the things that you and I would experience. But let's go deeper into the story. We also have to understand in the story that there is a tradition as well with Jewish culture. For a father of this man's status, if you study the story in the background of his life, he was a very wealthy, wealthy man. So there's the custom, and then on top of that custom, there was a position that this man had. He had a high authority position. And with high authority position, you were very well put together. You know, very, very Wall Street-like. You know, just everything has to be, be done a specific way. And so this, this father had a custom, and, and he had a tradition that he had to live up to because there was a culture that existed in this time with Jewish tradition and, and, and still does uh, for some who really live by that law. And, and so for a father like this man of this caliber, or even any man or any father for that matter, they would never, ever, never, never, ever, never run. Why? Because if, if you remember in those times, they wore, they wore tunics. So if they're wearing tunics, number one, they wear them for the, the, the purpose of covering themselves. And, and it's, it's very majesty-like, very, very pure-like. And so for the father to run, he would have to tie the tunic in order, because in those times they were so long, if you would run with it, you would trip and fall. No matter what, you're going to trip and fall. So think about how this father took a moment as he saw his son long away, far away, who he had been looking for every day. And now his son is coming and he can see him and he immediately grabs his tunic and he begins to tie it. And, and, and guess what? In these times in culture, it was unacceptable for men to, sh to show their bare legs. That was shameful. It was shameful. It was perverted. It was seen as something that is disgraceful to our community, disgraceful to our culture. How dare you? And so this father literally ties his tunic and he starts running. This dude must have been an old guy. But he's running and running and running to, and, and, and it says, and it was long away. Another original verse says, and the sun was far away. And I don't know about you, but far away is far away. It's kind of like where you ask someone like, you know, who lives in Lancaster, where do you live? They just say far away. <laughs> That's it. That's all like, okay, cool, man. I ain't driving over there. <laughs> You're coming to me for this meeting. That's all I need to hear is far away. Are you with me? And so, so, so as, as you start thinking about all these things, here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. If it was shameful for a man to run in that culture, then why did his, did his, did his father run the way? What, what motivated this father to run the shameful run? What drove him? What moved him? What was it about him not not caring about what the tradition of his community, the culture, the religion, whatever it was, that he was willing to break the custom for a son who basically told him, you know what, Dad? Let's just pretend you're dead. Just give my money. And then he wastes all of the inheritance, the wealth that he was supposed to wait for because it was honorable. And the father has this audacity to look at the son and to look at his culture. To look at his son and to look at his culture. To look at his son and to look at... And he says, we're going to break this culture. What drove him? Love. But beyond the love, let me just tell you something about this. In this same culture, there was a, um, a ceremony called Kasaza. Everybody say Kasaza. And, and the ceremony kazasa, kazasa is the cutting off ceremony. In other words, if, if there were ever anyone in your family that would do what this prodigal son did, you were cut off. And so for some of you, you may have family members that you may have cut off, not intentionally, but unintentionally because you're just like, they're never going to come. 
They're never going to find Christ. And you can be upset and angry and all these things and, and, and not realize that, you know what, I'm, I'm, I definitely have to be one of the sons right now. Or I'm a father. I don't know which one. But remember I asked you the question, why do you think or what motivated this father to run in shame? Well, Kasaza was a ceremony that was done the moment any sinner would come back. Anybody here that has addictions or, or you, you know you're in your sin. Listen, sinners know they sin just like criminals know they're criminals. A liar knows he lies. A thief knows he steals. A murderer knows he murders. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't take it rocket science. It's, it's, it is what it is, right? And so they, they would already have this ceremony prepared for people like that. Sinners like you and me. People that were far away from God at one point, right? But in this ceremony, they want to make sure that they light you up. <laughs> they want to make sure that they expose you and show everybody your junk in the trunk. They, they, want, they want everybody to know, and this is what she did, and this is what he did, and this is what they said. And so, they're gonna, so they have a ceremony. Now, the, the ceremony of Kasaza is a ceremony where they grab a pot similar to this, maybe bigger. And they, they wait for the coming of that sinner, that loser that we probably call some people. And forget that we were once losers as well. And so what they do is they're, they're, they, they're, they wait, they see. And so let's just, let, let, let. come on, ma. help me out. Yeah, right here. No, no, right here. Jer Jeremy, come on up, please, for a second. Sorry about that, Kurt. Okay, so go way back there. Jeremy has tattoos, so let's use him. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I got one too, don't worry. So, so check this out. So they would look at someone like Jeremy. Let's say Jeremy was the prodigal son. He took his father's money, inheritance. He wasted it and all these things. So now, yeah, the community's like, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah. Start walking over here. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here? Where have you been? Why'd you do it? Who are you with? Where's it at? How many times? Why are you here? And, and they just, they, they just, they just, and, and, and so what happens is the ceremony, the pot, was you. So they, they say, you know what, this was once you. But you know what, Jeremy? You obviously have showed us that this really isn't you. Have a seat. What, what really, give Jeremy a big hand. <laughs> what really is you is they would come and you'd show up. And they would literally gather all the community and they would begin to question and begin to put down and begin to expose. And the moment they were done saying what they had to say, the ceremony would begin. And they would grab a pot like this. And this pot, they would grab it and do this. They would do that at the feet of the prodigal son or daughter. And that represented... You are now broken from relationship with your family, with your community, with everything of our culture. You are no longer welcomed here. And this was the ceremony. So what moved the father? It wasn't just the son. You know what moved the father? What moved the father was the fact that he understood the ceremony of Kazaza. And in the ceremony of Kazaza, there is also a tradition that follows that ceremony. And that ceremony states that the fathers are not welcome to the ceremonies, only their mothers. And their mothers are only welcome to beg for mercy. That's how low it is. They want the family to beg like dogs for mercy for a sinner like their son. And the father is to stay in the house and only look at the torture and the torment of all this ceremony through the window of his house. Can you imagine what fathers had to experience in this time? Obviously, this tradition was set in place because this did happen. Just like it happens today. 
Many of us have been filled with our sin and separated from God because of that sin. And it's not because God has separated us from him. It's because we have separated ourselves from him. But aren't you glad that we have a heavenly father who also has a heart to look after you and I in the midst of our deepest and darkest sin and hour and still look for you and I and ready to run at any moment. Why did he run? Why? Because he knew that the moment he saw his son, man, he better get to his son before the ceremony did. Because if he knew that that ceremony started, there's nothing he can do. But God always has a plan. If the steps of a righteous man and woman of God are ordered by God, well, guess what? God has also ordered a step for your salvation, a step for your healing, a step for your redemption, a step for your forgiveness. God has ordered every single step at every single hour of every single day. And so he runs. And just picture this. So, man, all the crowd, all the paraders, the haters... (laughs) came out ready to just give this dude a beat down they probably brought all their pots and all of them would just drop those and that symbolized the breaking of a relationship i believe that the father was motivated by kasaza i believe that he was motivated with the fact that i'm going to get to him before they do you see you have an enemy his name is satan And the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And he comes to accuse you day and night. And he says, now look what he did. Now look what she did. Now look, God. Now look look at her again. There she goes again. Look look at her. Look, you call this a daughter? (laughs) But God the Father rolls up his sleeves. Breaks the custom of the law. The law that requires your death. And God the Father looked down from heaven on earth. And he said, I'm going to break their kasaza. And I'm going to break it with my son, Jesus. Who will take the shame from you and put it upon him. Who will take the sin of you and place it upon him. Who will take all of the stuff that you and I are very well aware of. That we have committed sin against our heavenly father. And our father still loves us so much. And he shows so much mercy and grace. That he gave us the perfect cleanest lamb. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus at that cross filled with shame. You're talking about a royal son now in rags. And he's on this cross and he's looking down. And he is saying forgive it. You see, his arms were stretched out this wide because God wants to remind you that his arms are always wide open waiting for you to return. And he embraces that prodigal son. And he says, let's not talk about that. And he puts a ring on. What is the ring for? Commitment. Covenant. What's the robe for? To clothe you from your unrighteousness and he clothes you with his righteousness what's the fatted calf it's your savior Jesus someone had to be slaughtered for your junk and his name is Jesus someone had to pay the price for your stuff and his name is Jesus there had to be a sacrifice so let me ask you again Do you still believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you still believe that the local church is the breath of life for your co-workers, your friends, your family? Do you have a spirit of a father who is ready to seek and save that which has been lost? Are you ready? to receive maybe you're the lost person maybe you're the one that has been out of your mind but today you're coming back to your senses and you're realizing who is this love that's been waiting for me I'll tell you his name is God and his son Jesus paid the price for you and for me and whatever the devil has broken in your life God knows how to go back and pick up all the broken pieces and he boom and he does this voila and it's all back together again and you're a better version of your former Are you hearing me today? If you're here and you're someone that's 
as a family member, you've been believing for your loved one, but you stopped. I'm here to tell you again, keep praying. Keep watering it. Or maybe you're here and you're saying, I'm the gasper. I'm just gasping. I'm barely making it. I'm just, I feel just breathless. I feel like I can't take another step. I'm telling you that he's the breath of life because you know what? Sin will literally cut the air of God. You don't have to be with prostitutes and drunk and living a party life to be far away from God. You can be in a place of unforgiveness. Think about it. The, the second brother, the brother that was in the house, in the church, he was a Pharisee. In other words, he held on so tight to tradition, yet he went to church every Sunday, read his Bible, prayed, and yet he had trouble forgiving. He had trouble with bitterness. He had trouble with resentment. That's why he was called the slave. I have slaved for you all these years, and this is what I get. That's why religion enslaves, but relationship sets you free. And his name is Jesus. Or maybe you're the consumed person. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's my success, my efforts, my life, my house, my car, my career. Wonderful things. Go for it. But not at the expense of the heart of the Father who saved you and you forget to save others. Not at that expense. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.